We're talking about Soren Kierkegaard. I am Rocket Kirchner, um, a professional musician, and I uh, want to talk about, this is called Kierkegaard Reconsidered. Um, why Kierkegaard should be reconsidered in the 21st century, why he is important to, um, to our time now, maybe even more important now than ever, actually. Um, but I just want to say this. You know, who is Soren Kierkegaard? Um, he was a Danish philosopher, not a theologian. He was a philosopher. He was uh, the father of existentialism and a very, very, very eccentric Christian that, that, that uh, had a real problem with the Church of Denmark as well as science and all of the isms of the day. Uh, what are some of those isms of the 19th century? I have a little list here from my notes uh, over the years. Uh, for example, Zionism, Communism, Anarchism, Nationalism, Capitalism, Evolutionism, Feminism, uh, Hegelianism, Humanism, Utilitarianism, Positivism, Pragmatism, Vitalism, Instrumentalism, uh, Structuralism, so on and so forth. And these were all raging in the, in the 19th century in Europe and some in America, but mostly on the continent of Europe, uh, to try to basically um, explain, to try to, 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 not explain, but try to be an antidote for the problems in history. In other words, here's the problem in history that's got us into this mess, and we're going to come up with an ism that is going to be the, the antidote for that problem. And it, they were using a lot of Hegel's dialectic, the Hegelian dialectic, that is thesis, antithesis, synthesis, to reach an absolute idea. And these utopianistic isms um, raged heavy in the 19th century, and they were in competition with each other. And um, two, two men stood up against this. And one was Friedrich Nietzsche, and the other was Soren Kierkegaard. Um, Kierkegaard preceded Nietzsche a little beforehand, and we will deal with him. What Kierkegaard said was, existence is not a category that relates to axioms and systems, but existence itself is a category that relates to being an individual. Um, of course, this just incensed people, but he was such a genius in the way he was able to present it. And one way he presented it was, uh, and I'll show you the way he, he, he actually talked about it in one of his books. Um, he talks about, he uses an analogy. We have here, pick the drink of your choice. For Kierkegaard, it was cognac. Um, for me, it's uh, club soda or coffee. And that would uh, be a... Um, let's say, an analogy to how we define ourselves. How do we analyze ourselves? Okay, let's say I'm, you know, I, I analyze myself as, you know, I'm Rocket Kirshner, I'm a musician, I like females, I play chess, blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, you may analyze yourself in your, your own way. And that's the same as drinking of the dregs of life, drinking of the cup, uh, uh, drinking everything out of there. And you think, okay, well, I just, uh, I've just analyzed myself. I've just done it. And all, all I need to do is find a system and an ism to cling to, and uh, everything can be hunky-dory. Well, Kierkegaard said there's only one problem with that. And that one problem is there's a residue that's left over after you've drunk from that. And the residue that's left over, and he actually uses this image, is... The surd, which where we get the word absurd, which is translated into the English as the irrational. So basically, Kierkegaard is saying at the core of each one of us is something that is irrational, that is undefinable, and then cannot, let me get make sure that our little dude here, the surd, can sit up straight. <laughs> Uh, he's having a hard time sitting up straight on my cup. 
That's about as straight as he's going to get. Anyway, um, so the Surd, uh, the Irrational, has a really tough time um, being defined. In fact, it's impossible to define. Hegel said that the real is rational and the rational is real. Kierkegaard said that only by rejecting all objective certainties can one come to truth, for truth is subjectivity. And um, if, it, if you think that sounds strange now, imagine how strange it sounded in the 19th century. And so we have this. What exactly is the irrational of the third? It is your existence. It is my existence. I'm not, it's not our. Kierkegaard makes that clear. It's not our existence. It's your existence. It's their exist. It's my existence. And the way we, the way we understand life, is we have to. It has to be lived out. For Kierkegaard said, life does live forward, but only understood backwards. So. It has to be lived out, um, and that's what it means to be actualized. One has to actualize one's existence, because ultimately, one's existence, one's individual existence, is indefinable. Analysis will just take us so far. Um, in this framework, Kierkegaard has the three spheres of existence. Those three spheres are, first, the aesthetic sphere, represented by Don Juan, the seducer, sensually, and Girde, the seducer, intellectually. Uh, number two is Socrates, and that is the ethical sphere. He's a man of the universal. Um, and uh, number three is the sphere of transcendence or what Kierkegaard calls the harsh landscape. And that's represented by Abraham, who was willing to give up more than what Socrates gave up, his life. He was willing to give up his son Isaac. Um, this imagery of Abraham embracing the transcendental hypothesis, uh, he stands in absolute relationship to the absolute. This is done through what Kierkegaard refers to as the leap of faith. So, um, in regards to the paradox of the God-man Christ um, that cannot be defined for Christ is an object of faith. So we have these three spheres of existence. The aesthetic, the ethical, and the transcendental or spiritual. And Kierkegaard wrote two books on this, uh, Either Or, Part 1, Either Or, Part 2. So, to him, to, in Kierkegaardian thought, these, these never, they never mesh. The aesthetic man has no interest in anything moral or ethical. And uh, the ethical man has no interest really in anything spiritual. He's found his own, or she has found their own ethos. And the spiritual man has no interest in things ethical. He leaves all the concepts of morals and ethics behind. For as Kierkegaard said in Fear and Trembling, the ethics is te teleologically, for a purpose, suspended. As Abraham walked up Mount Moriah to offer up Isaac, he trampled all notions of morals and ethics with each step. That's why the book was called Fear and Trembling. So, um, just looking over a few of the notes here, um, a, a number of atheists in the 20th century embraced this, uh, Kierkegaardian thought. Uh, it's interesting, they embraced uh, a Christian, um, was the number one influence on the atheists of the 20th century. Um, basically um, Heidegger, Sartre, and Camus, and uh, they were embraced by virtue of the absurd, things that are, that are normally uh, uh, 
where, where reason runs out. For example, after World War II, after World War II, reason, it was just how do you make sense of such, of this thing? And they reason, they, they figured that they couldn't make sense of it, except by virtue of the absurd. And so you have a whole rash of, uh, of really insightful literature and philosophy that comes out of, 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 of atheistic thinkers and of some theistic thinkers also. Uh, Burjeff, who was influenced by Dostoevsky, uh, um, Barth, people like that, Tillich, um, and to a, to, a, to a certain extent Bonhoeffer. Why did this turn around, or how did this get turned around? Anthony Flew, in England, the number one uh, uh, analytic philosopher, uh, studied under Bertrand Russell and A.J. Ayer. Uh, after he he had written forty books on atheism, and uh, he was a rational atheist. Um, and of course, the British weren't buying buying any of this Kierkegaardian stuff. They were holding holding fast to the tradition of uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Prove it to me. Prove it to me. Prove it to me kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Flew wrote an amazing piece of work called Theology and Falsification. And in that, because of that, there was a reaction from rational theists, brilliant rational theists in the Socratic club, like C.S. Lewis. And then on down the line, um, uh, the, the work of uh, uh, Paul Davies and, uh, you know, Francis Collins and the Genome Project, and and various rational theists, and of course the rea the reaction to that, and I'm not talking about response, but really reaction, you know, and intelligent reactions, the the reaction to the rational theist movement, as we move toward the end of the 20th, 20th century, the reaction to that comes by Richard Dawkins to begin with, with the God delusion, and that and that spawns in the 21st century the rational atheist movement. Then you have Dennett following with um, another rational atheist, following with Breaking the Spell, Sam Harris with The End of Faith, and then of course God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. Uh, these guys really said nothing new because Soren Kierkegaard's book Attack on Christendom was much more vicious than any atheist could ever attack it. And he had, he was a Christian, paradoxically. Um, so, where are we now? We're in the 21st century. How do we? How does this thing turn around? Um, it's become we're, we're caught in a feedback loop right now of rational theists and rational atheists going around and round and round and round and round. Whether you've seen the debates in in, in person or whether you've seen them on YouTube, um, it's just gotten tautological, circular, and boring. And it's got it's going to get more boring since Christopher Hitchens has died, because at least he was exciting and was more well-rounded in his understanding of literature uh, and dissent. So uh, this is why we need to reconsider Soren Kierkegaard, in my opinion. Um, we need to reconsider seriously picking up his work and reading it, whether you are a believer or a non-believer, uh, an atheist or a theist, uh, Kierkegaard's concept of virtue of the, by virtue of the absurd, I do, I believe, and is the father of existentialism can break the knot, can break through the feedback loop of the over-prevailing hyper-rationalism that is choking our society today. That's all.